and welcome to the next section on uh, partial dependence plots in our chapter on feature effects. So we'll discuss here the relationship between partial dependence plots and see that they are basically just a simple average of the already introduced ice plots. And while the ice plots are a global inter a local interpretation uh, technique, PDP plots uh, take a more um, global perspective. Um, we'll discuss how these PDP plots can then be interpreted as an uh, average marginal effect, like an yeah, like a like a marginal effect um, regarding a certain feature of interest. We'll discuss the problem of extrapolation and interactions in PDP and um, conclude with a slight variant of ice and PDP plots, which are called uh, centered plots. Okay, so. Um, first of all, let's look at the basic definition of a p partial dependence function. Now, this is, um, was already introduced by Friedman uh, now more than 20 years ago. So um, again, we'll take a look at a certain feature of interest, so xs, and we want to plot uh, the marginal effect of our function f hat with respect to that feature. And again, uh, for now, I guess, uh, assume that um, f hat is a regression function that we are now only looking at a single feature and again as for ice plots um, you can usually just plot that for a single feature maybe for two features and then all of the other features we will collect here in minus s and what we now are going to do is we're just going to average out um, um, yeah, for a given value of xs so let's maybe say xs is uh, just one yeah? and we want to plot the function or compute the partial dependence value of our partial dependence uh, function at xs equals one. So we are now looking for the average predicted outcome yeah? if we average out over all of these remaining features. So what we'll just do is we'll compute the average and integrate out over the distribution over all of these features. and um, this estimation we can do in a, a fairly simple manner. So we just iterate over all of our data points and we plug in all of the um, feature values for all of our data points, except for XS, yeah, where um, we simply, I guess we can also do this without the star, we just simply uh, plug in the value that we are currently, that we currently want to compute. And then we um, yeah, kind of go from this um, yeah, theoretical integral here to the um, yeah, empirical estimation where we just average out with respect to our um, training data set. So um, I guess before we do this uh, in an example, so let's just take a theoretical look at a linear regression model. Um, we we'll, um, take a simple linear model with two features and coefficients beta one and beta two and an intercept beta zero. And we'll compute now the um, partial dependence function for the feature of interest uh, x1. So all of the remaining features here are only two. Um, so um, minus s is just the second feature. So now we want to compute this partial dependence function um, with respect to x1. So we have to integrate out uh, with respect to x2. So what will happen now here? So if we take a look at the integral, then there are several parts in there that um, yeah, are constant with respect to x2. And um, yeah, the integration is a linear operator, so we can easily draw them out. So uh, we can draw out this guy here, and we can also draw out, uh, let me take a look at this guy here, of course. So this is the only thing that remains. Now, what does the resulting function look like? Yeah. So if we just integrate that out, so um, this will all, um, yeah, um, this will all compute to a constant. So we now have a function, which is just a linear slope, yeah, or a linear function with a slope beta one. Okay, as in our linear model, the only thing that is potentially different now is that. Um, this function here is shifted by a certain intercept, which is given by these two values, which is the intercept of our original linear model. And then there's a second term in there, um, which is um, 
yeah, the beta beta two coefficient times the expectation of x two. Okay, so um, that that coefficient here in a certain uh, sorry or this this uh, this shift term here, this constant intercept, even has a somewhat understandable interpretation. And um, yeah, the um, marginal effect that we are com computing as a function and its slope, uh, except for its shift, is exactly um, what we would have expected. So uh, I guess that gives us a plausible result here for this uh, for this linear regression model. Um, we can now take a somewhat deeper look at how partial dependence uh, plots can be computed. So. The estimation of the partial, partial dependence, so how, is, how this is computed in practice on data. So this is simply a pointwise average of ice curves um, at the given grip values. I guess you might have guessed that already from the initial definition here, but um, and I hope you remember how we computed the um, how we computed the ice curves um, in the session on ice curves. So what we do here is we take a look at all of the ice, uh, all of the individual ice curves, and now at a certain point. Um, for example, at um, x1 equals 1, so that's kind of our first grid point, we take the prediction value of all of our ice curves, and we just average them, and that gives us the first value of our partial dependence function. And then we can do that for the second point and for the third point. Uh, so if we just average pointwise like that through the ice curves, that gives rise to our partial dependence uh, function. And we usually compute these two things together because next to the PDP curve, we also usually want to visualize the ice curves. Um, so um, the partial dependence function gives us an average effect. So how does our prediction uh, change on average or how does the expected prediction change if we change x, x1? And uh, the ice curve, as we already discussed, gives us a local interpretation. If we are at a certain point x star and we change our feature x1 um, or a temperature feature here in the spike sharing data set, um, how does the um, prediction for that individual observation change? So um, the reason why we usually plot these ice curves next to the PDV curve is that we would like to see um, the general functional shape of the PDP curve reflected in all of these ice curves. So our ice curves should um, reflect a homogeneous effect um, because only then we can reasonably sure that there are no interactions going on in the background. Um, so in this case, like I already said, we look at the spike sharing data set. That's a very uh, often used um, example data set and I guess we'll see this again and again in, in this lecture here. So let me explain this a bit. So this is data uh, for, for various bike uh, rental shops and um, we look at the predicted number of bike rentals depending on um, you know, seasonal and temperature features. So we look at the temperature at a current day, the humidity at a current day, the season, the date and so on. And what we can see here because there is a homogeneous effect in the ice curves we hopefully with our safety can interpret here the PDP plot and um, there are hopefully not too many interaction effects going on in that model. And we can uh, conclude that um, the warmer the temperature becomes, the more bikes we uh, rent out. Seems very plausible. And then there's here a mild uh, downward slope at the end because if it gets too hot, I guess people become a little bit too lazy um, to um, ride a bike. Um, we can also produce these um, PDP plots for categorical features. We can either do this with box plots um, or we can do this with parallel coordinate plots. So we just put our categorical feature now on the um, on the x-axis here. Um, hopefully our categories can be somehow reasonably ordered. If, it's, if everything is unordered, we might just uh, resort back to um, pairwise comparisons. So we didn't do that here on the slot uh, on the on the slide. So um, we picked here for the bike sharing data set this um, season feature, uh, which has um, well, obviously the seasons are ordered from winter, spring to summer, and fall. And we can now either plot the um, um, yeah, variance um, that goes on uh, in the background of the PDP value through the ice through the ice curve values as a box plot, or we can have these parallel coordinate plots, which now really look similar as the PDP plots before for uh, numerical features. 
Um, some comments on extrapolation. So I, I touched upon that in the introductory chapter. So um, extrapolations can cause issues if we integrate out over, uh, I don't know, fake or um, um, artificially generated observations, um, especially if features are correlated and if there are interactions in our model. And um, that can really happen with the PDP plots. So in this case, our features X1 and X2 are strongly correlated. Um, the black points are the observed points of the original data, and you can directly see the um, correlation from the distribution. And now the red points are the grid points used to calculate the ice and PDP curves. Yeah? And these are exactly these, uh, these points uh, that are um, yeah, constructed um, from these uh, virtual data matrices here, where we plug in the grid values for the first column for X1. And um, if we do that, uh, we produce points on that um, regular grid here. And then we will also produce points which lie in areas where we have never observed any values. And we now um, compute predictions on those with our model where it has never seen any data points in that area. And then we average these predictions over the whole marginal distribution. And that might be problematic and um, uh, if our model behaves strange outside of that training distribution. Um, Interactions can be problematic. Um, so if we average out many different inhomogeneous ice curves, um, we might actually obfuscate heterogeneous effects and interactions. So it's usually a good idea to plot ice curves and PDP plots together to hopefully uncover this fact. So in, in, in this instance here, maybe, um, I don't know, um, you wanna characterize the effect of a uh, of, of blood pressure on a certain um, uh, medical intervention or something like this or for for the probability of um, developing a certain disease and um, now suppose there's something like a uh, different effect going on for males and females so maybe for uh, males there's a positive effect um, and for females there's a negative effect and you can in this simple case, directly read that off from the uh, structure of the ice curves. Um, but if we now um, average over them yeah, and only plot the PDP plot, uh, that might give rise to the interpretation that there is no effect at all um, in the data, which is completely wrong, right? They are two very strong effects. They just have opposing signs and there's a strong interaction going on between blood pressure and uh, gender with respect to the uh, predicted outcome. Um, yeah, our PDP plot just simplifies the situation too much by, by averaging out over these two uh, inhomogeneous groups. And the other problem is that if we just look at the PDP plot, um, and this doesn't, this only tells us probably if there's su that, that such a situation goes on, but we don't really see um, yeah, um, what the interaction is between X1 and a different feature or with what feature that inter interaction actually occurs. You would have to do some extra form of computation yeah, and kind of, I don't know, cluster these curves yeah, um, and figure out then whether um, these are all of the males and uh, these are all of the females. Um, of course, we can also do the partial dependence plots in uh, 2D. So we did this here again for the bike sharing data sets. We plotted the number of uh, rented bikes as a background color here and with respect to temperature and humidity and then we plotted the ice curves for temperature and we plotted the ice curves for humidity and you can see that there is at a slight a different effect um, I guess you can see the uh, interaction um, a little bit more clearly here from the 2D um, PDP plot um, and from for the ice uh, curves, especially for temperature, you can see that there's a slightly different shape going on um, for um, yeah, high values, um, especially for um, uh, high values of humidity if we uh, look at the ice plots with respect to temperature. Yeah. But in general, we could conclude from this, so for low to medium humidity and high, te uh, high temperature, there are many bikes uh, rented from our shops. Um, yeah, as a last part in this session here, I would now like to introduce centered ice plots. So um, usually um, if you look at these plots here and you 
want to recognize that they all have the same shape that makes it a little bit different to detect if um, all of these uh, ice curves are, are shifted uh, by a different intercepts and they are all stacked on top of each other. Um, so uh, the centered ice curves try to remove that. So um, for centered ice curves, we pick a fixed reference value. So some X dash value, often that is um, the minimum value of our uh, feature of interest of our feature XS. And now we simply shift the ice curve plot by that fixed value. Uh, and um, that turns such a stacked ice curve plot into something like this. Um, so we did this here again for, for the humidity in percentage um, for, the, uh, for, the bike, uh, for the bike rentals and also for the temperature in degrees Celsius. And now our interpretation of that ice curve um, and, uh, it changes a bit. So on average, we now take a look at the number of bike rentals or sorry, um, if we take a look, for example, at the number of uh, bike rentals for humidity around 90, 97, yeah, we are here. So this tells us that um, the bike rentals decreased by um, approximately 1000 bikes when we compare this to a humidity of zero uh, percent. Okay, so this is now a relative change that happens with respect to that reference value in the ice plot. Um, and we can do the same for categorical features. Um, and uh, if we do this for categorical features, there's also a nice interpretation and connections to linear models where we have these reference values going on, uh, usually also for, for categorical features. So here we take the reference category spring for the feature season. So this guy here is uh, our, our reference value. And these golden crosses now in our plot are the average number of bike rentals if we jump from spring to any other season. So for example, the number of bike rentals drops by approximately five to 600 in winter. Yeah. So if we go from here to this guy, yeah, we have a drop in bikes relative um, um, to the season spring. So going from spring to winter, about 560 bikes less. And it's a slightly higher in um, summer and fall, uh, if we again compare to this reference value. 